Madam First Lady, Mr. Kimelda Romualdez Marcos, Mr. Speaker, Mrs. Macalintal, Mr. Chief Justice, Madam, Your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, my colleagues in the Batasan Pambansa, members of the judiciary and the bench, my co-workers in government, especially those in the military organization, my friends. I deeply acknowledge this rare privilege of introducing our distinguished guest of honor and speaker. My entire career in the public service has been spent under his leadership. I've seen him work as chief executive, as a statesman, and as commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the Philippines, especially at the most crucial period in our history. I shall not speak of the qualities of his leadership or his achievements as the leader of the Filipino people. These qualities of leadership and, he, and these achievements are best left to the judgment of history. Permit me, however, to say that beyond all his achievements, beyond all that he has done to keep our nation peaceful, secure, and progressive, he has brought honor and dignity not only to his office, but to the entire Republic by his deep and abiding respect for the Constitution, the highest law of the land. For indeed, under his leadership, the Philippine Constitution has found the fullest as an instrument for reform, for public order, and for social justice. It was the Constitution which ordained the proclamation of martial law and the birth of a new order. And it is the same Constitution which now provides the framework for the transition to normalcy and the promise of a greater Philippine society. It is for this that it gives me the highest honor and the great pleasure as President of the Philippine Constitution Association to present to all of you our fellow constitutionalist and friend, His Excellency President Ferdinand Edralin Marcos. Thank you very much, Minister Juan Ponce and Rile of um, Defense. I greet um, the Chief Justice of uh, the Supreme Court and uh, Mrs. Fernando, the Speaker of the Batasan Pamba, and Mrs. Macalintal, Assembly, and Carmen Sita. And of course, uh, the lady who has jurisdiction of us here, since he's <laughs> governor of Metropolitan Manila and minister of human settlements. I greet the um, foreign guests, special members of the diplomatic corps, the members of the judiciary. The Supreme Court all the way down to the municipal courts and uh, our legislators, my fellow administrators in government, my
history summons us once to an encounter with destiny. It is the privileged shape of generation, yours and mine, that it has been called twice by that same history to serve. Life and honor in the hour of crisis and the hour of need. The first time, of course, was when we had the war, a war on bone making, in order to defend our country. The second time was when we had to impose on ourselves eight years and four days less than four months of uh, a martial discipline in order to save the Republic. Today we are privileged once again. We have another encounter with destiny. The magnitude of this moment necessarily brings us back to the very first crisis in the life of our people when nearly a century ago our forebears in Pugadlawin, Tirad Pass, in Kawit, in Malolos, offered their lives, their happiness, and most valuable of all, their sacred honor to a quest that we pursue to this very day, the great quest for a new society. This was and has ever been the Filipino dream, a dream of a new order of national existence. A dream thwarted for close to a century. We have had a hundred years of solitude, a century of alienation from one another, a hundred years of humiliation and distorted values. And so it was that eight years ago the consequences fell upon us. A social order in which the privileged of the few were enjoyed over the degradation of the many. In some, the social indifference of the elites spawned the rebellion which Sweden called the rebellion of the poor, in which legitimate grievances were exploited by conspiracy and subversion to bring about the destruction of the Republic of the Philippines. The death of a nation through violent revolution. Indeed, the perils which threatened the Republic then were brought about principally by the failure of the elites, the oligarchy, incarnated in a political society which deluded rather than educated the masses of our people in the ways of an authentic democracy. We had a political and social culture that was dominantly populist and opportunistic. History has shown to us how societies are saved and rejected in various ways. In the few years, the kings curb the excesses of the ruling barons or vice versa. At other times, check the abuses of kings. Still in other periods, governments protected the common good against the rapaciousness of the ruling class. An example from recent memory was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's proclamation of the New Deal. Essentially, this was the point what we have since called the revolution from the center which bought time for our people so that they could muster the strength to stem the tide of turmoil and rediscover their solidarity. The old constitution, colonial as it was, approved by an alien power as it was, nevertheless provided the legal and peaceful means for this quiet revolution. We were to have cherished and protected it. And we now have a new charter whose ratification we celebrate today, which we must cherish all the more 
for it is our very own, for it brings together a new system, a new policy, and the resurgent spirit of a new people. There are those who would denigrate this constitution. I am afraid they live in the past of their lost glories, a past when the freedom and the happiness of the few were held up as the freedom and the happiness of the many. It was a night or of a remembered greatness, shall we say. I am moved to recall how 16 years ago I appealed for the support of our people with an invitation to greatness. Seven years later, the gravest appeal was upon us menacing our lives and freedom, freedom of generations yet to come. Anarchy, assassination, arson, pillage, destruction, immobilization of the economy, destruction of public buildings, and the proclamation that the new government would take over the Republic of the Philippines. I saw that crisis as the test of Filipino greatness, and I was elated that our people shared my vision that crisis, my friends and my countrymen, is far from over, but we have proven ourselves in the past eight years to be equal to any such crisis. To be sure, it had been necessary, imperative to resort to the discipline of martial law, to summon the to its sworn duty to defend and protect the Republic. But as events showed, contrary to our detractors, Cassandric warnings, our armed forces performed honorably and well. In accordance <laughs> in accordance with the noble traditions of their warrior forebears, they upheld the Republic, but for the civil authority. They shall ever remain. <laughs> as a model, as an example, that shall be set up, if in days to come after this, the Republic should ever stumble once again, our people will ask, how did the military of that decade of the 70s. How did these noble warriors and soldiers conduct themselves in those crucial days? And they shall point to you as the heroes whose lives they must emulate. <laughs> yes, we owe them the highest commendation. Words are inadequate to express our gratitude to the men of the military and to the men of the civil government who quietly subordinated themselves in many cases whenever there was actual combat. The martial discipline has restored the pride, nay, the self-confidence of our race so that now we can look upon ourselves as equal to every vicissitude, every burden, every challenge. We can now accept without reservations the invitations to greatness, the challenges of the modern world. The cynical, the timorous, who would doubt this, had better look closely to what has transpired in this country less than a decade, in less than a decade, in the eight short years of the new society. We have disarmed the criminal syndicate and significantly diffused the dangers of subversion, sedition, rebellion, and cessation. All over the world today you see the same symptoms spread out among all the third world countries. Fortunately here in the Philippines the symptoms have significantly and substantially been reduced. 
These were the results of the relentless and determined campaign to reestablish public order. 200 private armies were dismantled. 250 criminal syndicates identified and their members apprehended and neutralized. 650,000 firearms within a period of two or three years. Of all classes, make one variety, including artillery, machine guns, assault rifles, tanks, armored cars, and the latest models of sophisticated armaments. Perhaps ten times more than the arms of the armed forces of the Philippines were confiscated or they were surrendered to the government. More than 2,000 ordinary criminals long wanted under unserved warrants of arrest before the proclamation of martial law were immediately apprehended and brought before the court. The leftists and the rightists joining together in rebellion were successively apprehended, eliminated or neutralized, thus reducing the rebellion to small pockets of resistance in a few places. The colonial centuries old hostilities in southern Philippines between Christian and Muslim brothers, which exploded eight years ago, into a formidable secessionist war in which was estimated 20,000 fully armed men, some of whom were trained outside the Philippines, were set against uh, the small garrisons of the police and the Philippine Constabulary while we were fighting the leftist rightist rebellion here in Luzon. This has been effectively terminated with the granting of amnesty to more than 37,000 members of the Moro National Liberation Movement. This, plus the establishment of the two autonomous governments in Regions 9 and 12, effectively terminates that movement. The armed forces of the Philippines and the intelligence agencies have succeeded in apprehending and immobilizing the leaders and the members of the Partido Nagkaisang Socialista Democratico ng Pilipinas, or SOCDEM, which differs from all other socialist parties in that it promotes violence. And so have the armed forces and the intelligence apprehended the leaders and members of the Light of Fire movement, which seems to be the umbrella organization covering all those involved in terrorism, bombing, kidnapping, arson, blackmail, as well as plots and conspiracies for the assassination of leading personalities in the military and in the civil government. But more than this, we have transformed the lives of millions of our countrymen. Land reform, the principal cause of the Hukbalahap uprising, because of the repeated failure of the landowner-controlled Congress to redress the grievance of centuries was instituted. Some of you who are listening to me now belong, belong to that rebellion. But you have joined the new society. I see here Mr. Luis Taruk, Assemblyman of Representing Lev. I see many of the rebels from the South attending here. I see Al Talwan, the original field marshal of the World uh, National Liberation Front. I see Commander Roni. I see Camille Lukman. I see all these rebels who have raised the flag of intransigence against the Republic of the Philippines now joining hands in order to strengthen this commitment to the Republic for the maintenance of public order all over the land. And why did the Hukbalahaps join hands with the government? Because large estates were broken up and sold to the actual tillers of the soil. Because we immediately terminated the enslavement 
of the poor tenant farmer who inherited generations and generations of indebtedness without any possibility of payment whatsoever from his forebears to the landlord. This we immediately redressed with a single stroke of the pen. A new labor code was promulgated providing among others the joining together of management and labor with government. A tripartite conference for the settlement of issues and thus assuring industrial peace to allow economic growth. Social reforms also included the implementation of a nutrition program. There are now 4,000 day centers all over the land. Ours is a model which has been adopted by the United Nations. A health program, a family planning program which are, which have well long denied the humblest and the poorest of our countrymen. Our educational system has been reoriented to meet the needs of social and economic development with its emphasis on vocation existed through scientific research or before there was nothing but rhetoric and charlatanism. We have instituted the researchers. We have created a um, an institute of plant breeding and created exotic varieties of uh, plants that did well to increase our harvests. And now we have started an institute of microbiology which shall utilize the new science of recombinant DNA. In the administration of justice, which again caused the rebellion of the poor in our own society, we have assured our people expeditious, inexpensive, and democratic justice with the organization of barangay courts. The interim batas and pambansa is in the process of reorganizing the judicial system of government with the participation of the Supreme Court, with the aim in view of eliminating delays, bottlenecks, bottlenecks and club dockets in the courts as well as the elimination of its unworthy members, few as they may be. Our government has succeeded in reorganizing the National Prosecution Service and creating a nationally pervasive free legal service under the Ministry of Justice. We thus give substance to that constitutional and moral mandate that every man shall be entitled to his day in court. The political transformation above all assures us of a truly democratic system. The organization of the barangays has brought about an explosion of political participation as evidenced by the militancy of the, its members and by the participation of 23 million voters Whereas before, in 1969, there were only 8 million voters. I place my fervent hopes on the barangays and on the Sangunyan. <laughs> they are the testament to and the vehicle of popular sovereignty. With the barangays, power indeed has been returned to the people. Mabuhay ang mga barangay. The last eight years have also mobilized the energies of the Filipino for economic health in his society. And I believe we have yet to demonstrate we have demonstrated our capacities fully. Let us look at some of the data and statistics with your permission. I shall be sure the gross national product increased from 55 billion 526 million pesos in 1972 to 192 billion 911 million in 1979 
at 1972 constant prices or 269 billion 781 million pesos at current prices. Collections of government from taxes have increased from 5.1 billion pesos in 1972 to 36.16 billion pesos in 1980. Total export increased from 1.106 billion, 1 billion in 1972 dollars US in 1972 to 5 billion 935, almost 6 billion in 1980. Showing the stability of the currency, notwithstanding the present fluctuations of the dollar, the rate of exchange of the peso to the U.S. dollar has rarely moved, barely moved, from the 1972 6.67 to the 1979 7.37. Savings and time deposits have increased from 5 billion 402 million. Pesos in 1972 to 49 billion, 116 million, as of September 1980. Gross domestic investment has not only doubled, trebled, quadrupled, quintupled from 11, it has increased about 80 billion, a million. In 1980, while gross national uh, savings. Increased from 11 billion 679 million pesos to 62 billion 395 million in 1980. There was a time when the debt service ratio, before this administration, was more than 40 percent of the dollar earnings the previous year. This has been reduced to 20 percent, and now, as of 1980, reduced to 18.7 percent of foreign exchange earnings in the previous year. Incidentally, on the question of indebtedness, when we took over as president in 1965, most of the indebtedness were short-term indebtedness, payable within one year, two years, three years, five years. More than 90 percent. All of these were immediately uh, shifted or converted into long-term indebtedness for some reason or other, because of inefficient management of our affairs, because of our bad credit worthiness. We could not borrow any money from anywhere. The most that the World Bank could lend us before 1965 was 40 million dollars. By 1975 and 76, the World Bank had changed its opinion of the Philippines so much so that it was ready to lend at a single time 500 million dollars. But most of these borrowings did not go to government; they went into productive enterprise. The borrowings of government do not go to pay for salaries or what we, in government, call ordinary or current expenditures. Housekeeping, salaries of uh, officers and employees, as well as furniture, equipment. No, on the current budget, there is always a surplus. Since 1965 to the present. There has always been a surplus in the current budget of the Republic of the Philippines. We have borrowed, yes, we have borrowed, but only for purposes of productive enterprise. These are the self-paying and self-regenerating enterprises, which we must support. And incidentally, nobody lends you money. If you cannot give a counterpart, the least counterpart that is required is about 50 percent of the entire cost of the project. Now let's go to international reserves. International reserves were increased 
from practically zero in 1965. The statistics say $282 million were left in the central bank. When I asked the central bank, however, I was told that our commitment exceeded $300 million. And therefore, we did not have enough foreign exchange to pay our indebtedness as of 1965. The foreign exchange reserves were practically zero. And today, how much are the foreign exchange reserves? Today, we have $3 billion, $100 million in the central bank as the foreign exchange reserves of the Republic of the Philippines. <laughs> Finally, we speak of social indicators. How do all this affect the individual? What is his individual income? The per capita income, if we must talk in terms of all the people, has more than trebled from 214 U.S. dollars in 1972 to 755 U.S. dollars in 1980. And what do these figures mean to our masses, to our people? Some say the rich have grown richer and the poor have grown poorer. Well, we will not say they are blind to the facts. Let us say that they are prone to exaggeration. It is true, of course. The rich will grow richer because they have the funds and the capital and we have no intention of, of confiscating private property. It is not a part of the ideology of the new society to confiscate private property and private enterprise. <laughs> but we shall regulate wealth. And we regulate wealth so it shall not be utilized to brutalize the poor and the weak of our people. <laughs> and thus it is that the rich must pay heavier taxes. It is said that we have been easy on the rich with respect to taxes. This is not true. We increased the corporate tax recently only by, very recently by 5%. We increased the taxes on luxury goods, the goods that are bought by the rich, that are open only to the more affluent members of our society. Even in the case of oil products. Did you notice the difference between the tax or uh, between diesel fuel and industrial fuel and gasoline? It is a big jump for it is the purpose the, of this administration that first of all we shall not be zero. And today, how much are the foreign exchange reserves? Today, we have $3 billion, $100 million in the central bank as the foreign exchange reserves of the Republic of the Philippines. <laughs> Finally, we speak of social indicators. How do all this affect the individual? individual income. The per capita income, if we must talk to all the people, has more than trebled from 214 U.S. dollars in 1992 to 755 U.S. dollars in 1980. And what do these figures mean to our masses, to our people? Some say have grown richer and the poor have grown well let's say they are blind let us say that they are prone to exaggeration it is true of course the will grow richer because they have the funds and the capital and we have no intention of, of confiscating private it is not of the ideology 
new society to confiscate but we well and we well so it shall not be utilized to brutalize the poor and the weak of our people And thus it is that the rich must pay heavier taxes. It is said that we have been easy on the rich with respect to taxes. This is not true. We increased the corporate tax recently only by, very recently by 5%. We increased the taxes on luxury goods, the goods that are bought by the rich, that are open only to The difference between fuel, gasoline, it is a big jump. For it is the purpose the, of this administration to situate, first of all, not only regulate, regulate the wealth, we shall ask those who are capable and those who participate in harvesting the rewards of a progressive society to contribute what is just and proper to the maintenance of our republic. <laughs> yes, have no doubt about it. The wealthy have been discouraged from exercising the ways of the old oligarchy. But I am prepared to think that of our people today have developed a social conscience that is growing day by day. How often have they come the members of the cabinet offering contributions to worthwhile and noble projects? How often have they quietly done their own planning in order to uplift the poor and the degraded race and people? Let it not be said that because they are rich, they are not patriotic Filipinos. Even the rich and the flu country have acquired this is one of the developments of the new society. Now let us as to the distribution. Who cannot that this is a new world altogether and that income is now seeping into all classes of people. In 1972, the percentage of families with income 1,999 pesos and below was 24.3%. In 1979, this had been reduced to 11.2% or by more than let's go to the top the families with incomes of 30,000 and more in 1972 there were only 5% of them of the entire population now today there are more than twice that there are 12.8% of those who have this high income And considering that almost all of these families that I speak of live in the rural areas, the new society is set to effectively change the living of the Filipino masses. Finally, the effective minimum wage has increased from 4 pesos and 75 centavos in 1972 to 23.30 to 24 pesos and 70 centavos in 1980. Along with these political, economic, and social transformations, we must count the newly won prestige in the family of nations. Yes, the president of the Filconsa, Minister Juan Ponce, really referred to the new prestige, the new status 
of our um, country in the, the United States forums of the third world and we have normalized relations with socialized countries. Before this and even to China, the socialist countries of Eastern Europe, we limited ourselves to what considered to be the pillars of the free world and thus penalized ourselves and our products for our markets were limited. The Philippines is now heard in the Council of Nations because it speaks with its own voice. An independent foreign policy is the hallmark of the Philippine uh, Foreign Service. We We all are independent and we do not political independence must we want every day. Every time there is any threat or doubt cast upon that independence, not only the leadership but the citizenry must rise up and protect that independence. After much agonizing negotiations with the United the of America in fairness to this ally of ours recognized what is undeniable and that is the sovereignty of the Republic of the Philippines over all the military bases of the Philippines including that of Subic Naval Base and Clark Air Force Base against uh, the doctrine which indicated that America retained sovereignty over the base. <laughs> because of our martial interlude, our defense establishment and our armed forces have quietly established a self-reliant defense posture. As you know, defense and military establishment is not prone to publicizing its achievements or to bragging about its capabilities. But very quietly, in the past eight years, not only has it trained its personnel to meet any contingency, whether internal or external, it has systematically organized not only its own activities, but civil industry to meet most of its requirements. The government, which itself needed reforms in the crisis of 1972, has been reorganized. How many have we kicked out of government? More than 6,000. In the armed forces, more than 8,800 men. Very few people know that. We kicked out of the civil government 6,000 officers and employees. And many of them are still facing cases and charges before the Sandigan Bayan and the Tanud Bayan. In the armed forces of the Philippines, we punished 8,800 officers and men over a period of eight years. Let no man say that we have not exerted the utmost diligence in maintaining discipline in the enforcement of our laws and constitution under the Republic of the Philippines. <laughs> yes, we have eliminated the undesirable elements and we will continue the campaign against corruption through the establishment of the Tanud Bayan, which as you know is the Ombudsman, and the Sandigan Bayan, which you know is the court for, the cor for corruption cases. We are now actually engaged in identifying the corrupt government officials and functionaries. Conscious of the hardships ahead, therefore, we have embarked also on the, an effort to upgrade the civil service. And now we have also met head on this problem and crisis on energy. We have accelerated the energy program 
which includes the intensified search and prospecting for oil and gas and other hydrocarbons within our jurisdiction. We have discovered and are beginning to exploit new coal deposits. The entire island of Semirara we discover is coal. Deposits in Cagayan Valley are all over the entire valley. In Bicol, Mindanao, and Sama. We've discovered geothermal sources, eight geothermal units or geothermal centers of energy are operational. Six are being constructed. We are next to the United States in the volume of electricity coming from geothermal sources. Hydroelectric uh, power is uh, moving on. As you know, the biggest in Southeast Asia is being put up in the Magat, Isabella. We have discovered Mars gas or surface gas. We use biomass, dendrothermal. Many countries here represent, including France, Germany, England have lent us money for the dendrothermal uh, projects. And the Scandinavian. We have discovered exotic plants which produce juice and burn like gas. By only yesterday, the other day. The hunger which I know since boyhood. The fruit of a vine in Ipugao was brought back. We pressed the fruit and out came the juice and we lighted it like gas. You go all over the land. There are many plants from where which we can draw gas. There are conventional, indigenous and renewable sources of energy which we must stop and we shall stop. At this point, I must note the number of rural households that have access to electricity. In 1972, 76,000 households had access to rural electricity. Today, there are 1 million households that have rural electricity. We are next to the United States. No other the way we develop rural electrification. This increase is symbolic of the renaissance of the Filipino. Been of course the renaissance of our political life. In less than a decade of the democratic revolution, it is inevitable that this would be in spiritual terms. The renaissance in our culture, the rebirth and growth of the arts, music, painting, da dance, film, literature. And why? What is the importance of this? How often has song, dance, music, literature flamed the battle rise up for, to attain the ends of freedom? How often have our forebears, the propagandists of the last century, utilized literature in order to lay the moral basis for a rebellion that would free our country? Culture, tradition, belief in our past, this is the unifying force. We look back, we trace the roots of our identity, and we discover no reason to be so humiliated and to for the final race. We have contributed our people's genius to the arts of this century. We have also rediscovered our ancient art forms, our spiritual heritage. In doing so, we have rediscovered ourselves, the Filipinos.
the Filipino has reclaimed itself. And this is only the beginning. The last eight years, what could be achieved through discipline, this the eighties, will dramatize to us what can be achieved through self or inner discipline. As our wise men of the last century one the essential thing is not to win battles. The essential thing is to win the internal revolution. The revolution within one's our minds. For in the end, the transformation of a society means the transformation of man. It's man. Thus from this day on, we must be conscious and heed the invitation to greatness. National greatness, as, well as uh, um, we all know, means two things. Militancy of a citizen and the social commitment of a responsible elite, especially the intellectual elite. Let me repeat that. We shall need two things, the two weapons, as we move forward from this day on. The militancy of a concerned and enthusiastic citizen and at the same time the commitment of a uh, motivated elite especially the intellectual elite of our country <laughs> we have had their support. We need this more than ever now. I call upon all of you. I call upon the children, local executives, military men who was seeing raise them above those who have not gone wide and deep professional men we have the highest in the world in relation to population elite we must draw who would be the leaders of our in the next generation martial necessity has passed it has yes and served well the purpose becomes beleaguered. Cannot go on. Must mature. Grow from outer discipline into. And so it is that as I promised all the men, the morning of September 23, 107, and I announced the proclamation of martial law which had been signed before. With your support, myself, my life, and my family's life and honor, that's meant of his. That when the time came, when I must or we must end martial law, and that time could have been then, I was the first to move the termination of martial law. I have listened to you, our people. I have heard your doubts, your anxieties. Outright into the lifting of martial law. 
and I have prayed to the Almighty for guidance. Souls that I terminate my Time of crisis. The many protect well then. Now, I shall, I shall bring you an increase. Trust in Please, Mark. Seats and drink like undoubtedly. Artistically, we were all haunted by guerrillero, fighting a loser in the hills. For that was, many of us planned it well for heaven. Yet notwithstanding, one had to present the stern image of the leader, the dominating and at the time resolutely promised to each other sorry we would go mountains and if necessary fight losing battles with a smile in our lips <laughs> support of the people to do that. Spontaneous unanimity upon the question of martial law, you could hear the sigh of relief all over the land from the north to the south, from the east to the south, that we retain trust. States of be tempered credentials of legality and constitution. This way was it the commander in chief of course was contrived by as a device to consolidate power colonized people. 
those who drafted the comprehensive provision ever dreamt. It would be used instead by an architect and people. Long lost self-respect, dignity, and honor. In the long run, to be quite candid, the intellectual adventure is more exhilarating, inspiring. Only the observer will realize that the table had been turned and the weapon in the dark past that was used to browbeat our people down to their knees in submission to alien authority had been captured from the enemy through ingenuity and by some miracle of self-assertion and used to attain the noble dreams of our people. And so as I now sign this proclamation in full view of our nation and the world at large, I am profoundly conscious of the tasks that remain, hoping that we shall not lose the momentum of our achievements so that those who shall come after us may carry the quest of a greater, a brighter world a new society. I pray now and I ask you to pray with me as I prayed eight years ago that I am doing, that we are doing the right thing by our people for the end of martial law does not mean the end of our efforts, of our needed reforms, of our struggles, of our sacrifices. The passing of the martial necessity does not carry with it the passing of all the burdens, especially the heavy ones. There will be more tests for our capacity, for our resiliency, our strength as a people. Together we must pass this test. Surmount all crises. And so, as I have said, I sign in your presence, proclaiming the termination of the state of martial law, throughout the Philippines, I say, we have just begun. dispositive portion of this decree. Now therefore I, Ferdinand E. Marcos, President, Prime Minister of the Philippines by virtue of the powers vested in me by the Constitution, do hereby revoke Proclamation 1081, proclaiming a state of martial law in the Philippines, and Proclamation Number 1104, dated January 17th, 1973, declaring the continuation of martial law and proclaim the termination of the state of martial law throughout the Philippines, provided that the call to the armed forces of the Philippines to prevent or suppress lawless violence, insurrection, rebellion, and subversion shall continue to be in force and effect, and provided that in the two autonomous regions in Mindanao, upon the request of the residents thereof, the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall continue, and in other places, the suspension of the privilege of the writ shall also continue with respect to persons at present detained, as well as others who may hereafter be similarly detained for the crimes of insurrection or rebellion, subversion, conspiracy or proposal to commit such crimes, and for all other crimes and offenses committed by them in furtherance or in the occasion thereof, or incident thereof, or in connection therewith. General Order Number 8 is also hereby revoked, and the military tribunals created pursuant thereto are hereby dissolved. 
pursuant to Article 17, Section 2, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution, all proclamations, orders, decrees, instructions, acts promulgated, issued and done by the incumbent president, constitute part of the law of the land and shall remain valid, legal, binding, and effective even after the lifting of martial law unless modified, revoked, superseded, or altered by subsequent proclamation, orders, decrees, instructions, or other acts of the incumbent president, or unless expressly and explicitly modified or repealed by the National Assembly or the Batasan Pambansa. In witness zero, I have set my hand and caused the seal of the Republic to be affixed on the 17th day of January 1981. Thank you. His Excellency President Ferdinand E. Marcos signing the proclamation lifting the state of martial law throughout the Philippines. A day of history as we also commemorate the celebration of the ratification of the Constitution. His Excellency statements of the past eight years, the formulation and the creation of the new society. At the same time, the entire Filipino people stands with pride with him as he himself has initiated this great leadership and this great vision to make the Filipino nation and the Filipino truly great. It certainly has been a very uh, historic, emotional, mm, touching moment. Uh, clearly, no doubt, there is a certain dimension uh, to this affair here that one cannot capture in words the men uh, of the military, the armed forces of the Philippines, General Espino, uh, General Ramos, General Abad, General Sarmiento, uh, General Pars, Commodore Alejandro, they're all going and talking to the First Lady and the President. Uh, as I said, it's been uh, quite an emotional uh, moment here at the Heroes Hall in Malacanang. The uh, First Lady uh, obviously touched by the eloquence of the President and the forcefulness uh, with which he delivered this address and a very, uh, uh, the very deep sense of leadership, uh, patriotism and, and faith uh, that the President evidenced in, in that address this morning. Uh, he has always maintained his faith uh, in the integrity of our nation and our people and their good sense and the the fact that they have stood by him through all the moments of anguish difficulty and crisis and uh, uh, very clearly uh, he is depending and relying on that particular uh, level of support and faith in him as he mentioned uh, in his address uh, the a large group of people crowding around the the presidential table with the president and the first lady we see members of the diplomatic corps here who are still uh, gathered uh, at the heroes all none of them have made any many effort uh, to to move i see ambassador murphy here and um, uh, the, Ind the honorable indonesian Am ambassador his excellency the ambassador of indonesia uh, First Lady uh, and the President here, Speaker Makalintal, the uh, members of the Cabinet, uh, members of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, uh, the Gracious First Lady, uh, Minister Andrilia now in conversation with the President. Uh, as as uh, as the President uh, so eloquently pointed out uh, in his speech this morning, 
it's a question of faith and uh, very clearly uh, our people have uh, strengthened their faith under his leadership and will continue to do so the the achievements of the past eight years under the leadership of president marcos have clearly indicated that the people by and large are behind him have supported him and he has called for them to continue that support with the same resoluteness that uh, they have shown in the past the challenge indeed is is perhaps a new one a new challenges new challenges and but as i said it it is an emotional moment for all of us here who have in a sense been a part of this uh the president uh, moving down this way towards us with speaker makalintal and the first lady yes sir sir congratulations mr president tremendous speech and the faith of our people will be with you i hope that they maintain the trust uh, that they have reposed in the political leadership you have always let him move <laughs> you've, all, you've always acted with dignity and with the the, the interest of our people uh, as your first consideration mr president and we know you will continue to do so thank you thank you for your generous words thank you very much mr president ma'am it was an emotional moment for all of us but i think you must be proud with the faith the courage and the vision of this man yes um, this is uh, truly a very historical momentous uh, and happy occasion for uh, we can all be uh, happy to say that uh, this is a uh, yeah, we have uh, achieved a prideful uh, level of uh, in the redemption of our identity dignity and humanity as a people and uh, this tribute is uh, not only for the president but for each and every filipino who has really uh, achieved all of this to them from the bottom of my heart a deep full appreciation and gratitude thank you thank you very much thank you very much mr chief justice mr chief justice sir can we have a word from you mr chief justice in this in the midst of this large crowd that gather around the uh, the first lady as she moves away from uh mr speaker you're going to be on our program tonight at 9:30 yes 9:30 channel 4 that's in bohol right, right we'll discuss the full implications of this okay mr chief justice well uh, uh, i made the opening remarks i made clear the significance of the occasion and certainly i think the whole country joins the president in uh, rejoicing at this turn of events and i'm sure that under his leadership uh, the problems that some could foresee would not eventuate Thank you very much Mr Chief Justice. We were speaking to the Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court uh, Enrique Fernando Rita. I think it is with a great sense of pride that everybody who has gathered here this morning at the Heroes Hall here in Malacañang truly feel identified with the president. This decision to lift martial law on this day coinciding with the celebration of the ratification of the Constitution of 1973 speaks indeed highly of the leadership of this nation and of the Filipino people as a whole. We have as I said earlier gathered here not only our high ranking government officials but also the members of the diplomatic corps who have witnessed this historic occasion. As the president has said he has addressed himself firstly to the Filipino people and to the world and it indeed goes down in the history of our nation to have weathered through this crisis of the past eight years and have been able to prove to ourselves with deep pride and conviction that we can carry on without the outer constrictions of martial rule. Rita, is the, the president still find great difficulty moving out of the hall? Everybody around him, around the president and the first lady, seeking to congratulate him. I wonder whether I'll get a few words from the chief of staff of the armed forces of the Philippines, a very quiet gentleman who does a very good job uh, general romeo espino the president uh, general espino played paid the armed forces full tribute for the manner in which they conducted themselves during this difficult 8 years what do you see your role in the days ahead we'll have to i feel that there'll be no change in our role we'll continue as we were doing because we were not doing anything unusual during the last 8 years but keep the peace and you will continue to keep the peace and defend the republic as as good soldiers normally do yes indeed thank you very much general espino the armed forces chief of staff general romeo espino uh saying that there won't be any 
particular or any special change in their role. Uh, what they did was uh, keep the peace as uh, they are expected to do and they will continue to do so. So he sees no real change uh, in the role of the armed forces of the Philippines. Uh, we'll move around to get more reactions from different people. I see uh, Cesar Miraflor, the former Comelec Commissioner Cesar Miraflor. Good morning, sir. What are your initial reactions to the President's speech? Oh, well, it was, I was near an American, uh, the one who paid a tribute to him last night, Mr. Kavilti. And he said, I have never heard a speech like that before. He was a consultant of President Johnson, and he was all praised for the President, and we are proud of it. And as a, as a man who was involved in, in the Commission on Elections, as a member of the Philconsa, you must have some special thoughts about this. Oh, yes. You know, I used to say that martial law was, from the beginning, in the laws approved America. From the uh, instruction to McKinley, uh, President McKinley, Jones Law, the 35 Charter, uh, approved by President Roosevelt, martial law was there. And martial law continues. It is of American origin, and we respect it. Thank you very much, uh, former Commonwealth Commissioner, uh, now member of the Field Council, Cesar Miraflor. Thank you very much, sir. Rita? The President has just passed here, uh, milling through a very thick crowd that uh, stretches out to congratulate both him and the First Lady. Indeed, as I said, it's an emotionally packed day for all of us who have gathered here and perhaps for the entire Filipino nation. One of the most splendid addresses delivered by the President on this occasion, stressing with great pride the deep conviction not only of the leadership of the nation, but of the entire Filipino people. We have seen how over the past eight years we have weathered through this crisis and the crisis government that has survived the many conflicting areas. And finally, on this very day, we see the beginning of the greater responsibility and the greater task ahead. Rita, uh, when the martial law proclamation was first made public, the letters of instructions, the presidential decrees, the man who was in the forefront of our television screens for many, many years was the then Minister of Public Information, Francisco Estatad. He has seen the passing of time through eight years and there have been nuances in the developments and in this passage of time and he perhaps like the President and perhaps Minister Henry Le must feel particularly deeply on this occasion, Mr. Tata. Yes, indeed. Uh, the lifting of martial law, particularly the reading of the dispositive portion of the proclamation by the President uh, rekindled some memories. I was before the cameras in 1972 for something like two hours reading the original proclamation and uh, from the time on I was consistently on camera explaining decrees, proclamations, general orders and as you very well know I served the position for uh, the almost the entire length of uh, the martial law regime. I left the government only in January last year and indeed I must say that uh, something in me was moving, was touched all the while that I was listening to the President. And of course, uh, you must look with a deal of optimism to the future uh, and, and, and the challenges it poses. Well, I think we owe it to ourselves to look at the future with confidence. The past eight years have been years of challenge. Many areas, I think, we have done very well. In other areas, we may not have done as well as we wanted to. But I believe there is basic unity within the nation that could propel the government in its move forward. And that I think that we have come to recognize that the progress of this country will not uh, lie purely in the effort of government but will come from the collective effort of all sectors in the society with all the sectors interacting with government. Well put.
sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Assemblyman Francisco Tata. Rita is with Ambassador Murphy. Uh, Rita? Yes, Ronnie, I have here Ambassador Murphy of the United States of America. Together with the several chiefs of missions of the diplomatic corps have attended and witnessed with us this proclamation of the president. And perhaps you can get a reaction from the ambassador on the address made by the president and his proclamation to lift martial law. Well, certainly. I found it a most forceful eloquent statement on the part of the president about uh, the background of what had motivated him to declare martial law back in 1972 and the reasons that have now convinced him that the time has come to lift it. We do think uh, that his move is timely. We think, uh, I would say, that uh, it's a, an important step in the right direction and we very much welcome it. Against the background of the incoming new administration of the United States of America, how will this affect further the relationship between our two countries? Uh, I think uh, it would be wrong for me to speculate on the future of relations of the administration, which has not yet started. But I think, as I say, this is a very positive step. And I'd, I'd rather not speculate too much on the future. Thank you very much, Ambassador Richard Murphy of the United States of America. As we've said, the President did indeed have stress the importance of uh, this occasion and of course the uh, strength that we have as far as foreign policies are concerned. Ronnie? Yes. Uh, we were moving around uh, to Minister Australia. Minister Australia, um, Minister of Agrarian Reform. Uh, well, martial law, when it was instituted, one of the most significant moves by the president aside from the proclamation instituting martial law was the uh, land reform effort of this government the freeing of the tenant from the bondage of the soil how is that program progress this past eight years and do you think uh, that at this stage there's enough impetus for it to carry through you know Ronnie we that was really the most historic thing that the president did and no other president have done that the first step he did uh, upon declaration of martial law was the declaring the whole country land reform area, that is decree number two. The second was the emancipation of tenant farmers from the bondage of soil, that is uh, presidential decree number 27. And after eight years, uh, we made a report to the president that we have finished the land transfer operation. We have actually transferred the land to the tenant tiller. And that is the most historic thing, I believe. Not because I'm handling the program and I am happy that the president entrusted the whole program to me. Now that the president uh, lifted the, the martial law, it is another historic event. It is just as historic as him when he declared martial law. I see. Uh, now, as, as the president himself has pointed out, the farmers own the land they till, they live better, they work harder, they are an integral part of our society. That's right, Ronnie. They are, you go out in the countryside, you will uh, notice that, that the farmers are, uh, have never had it so good under martial law, under President Marcos. But there are going to be challenges ahead, no doubt. Uh, yes, of course. We will see to it that uh, we have to protect the gains we have made. We will not allow it to be negated or nullified. Thank you very much. Our Minister of Agrarian Reform, Conrado Estrella. I'll move across and see whether I can get a few words from, from Minister Virato, who is actually being uh, interviewed by... As some people fear economic uh, bankruptcy. Well, I really don't know uh, why all of these bad words are being used now uh, of economic bankruptcy. Uh, there is no such thing. We are developing uh, our per capita income. Our improvements in the Philippines has increased the number of enterprises. We have many more people. The market has enlarged. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, gained international standing as far as credit is concerned and uh, I do not see the point why uh, our own people will say that we are in the brink of disaster of bankruptcy I think uh, we should be more positive in outlook rather than detract from uh, the uh, main effort to uh, continue building our country okay thank you very much uh, Rita are you yes Rita the president of the integrated bar of the Philippines, Mr. Ed Angara, Angara who has been uh, very much involved in many of the legal discussions during the martial law days and of course 
With the uh, helm of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, we have had uh, many programs and analysis from his end, and perhaps we could have a post martial law analysis from uh, Attorney Angara. Well, I think it's a tremendous uh, boost because, first of all, it leaves a very heavy psychological burden on the minds of the ordinary citizen. Now I think uh, the ordinary average citizen can feel that he can uh, air or raise an, any legitimate grievance he has in uh, dealing with government agencies. I think that's, in general, the biggest positive uh, post-martial uh, post law lifting effect. The other, to me, depends really on two key institutions. One is the Batasan, and the other is the media. I think uh, the, uh, the positive impact of the lifting of martial law will continue and will remain to be positive as long as the members of the Batasan uh, continue to be uh, responsible and see their role to be constructive and positive. On the other hand, I also see that media or the press is a key institution in a post-martial law society because this, uh, the press and parliament are mood indicators of the society. They set the mood of the citizen and the business climate. So depending on how the two key institutions conduct themselves in a post-martial law society, I think will depend whether the lifting is positive or negative. How about from the point of view of legal practitioners? From the point of view of legal practitioners, I think the, the, maybe the timidity and the reluctance to question the legality or the propriety of certain governmental action will vanish, maybe not overnight, but slowly. Well, thank you very much, Ed, uh, the president of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, Attorney Edward Angara, with uh, some analysis and reactions coming from his end. Ronnie? I'm, uh, I'm actually waiting to talk to Assemblyman Emmanuel Pelaez, who's just given me a sign that he's, he's going to come over, uh, because we'll have to, we'd like to talk to Assemblyman Pelaez about the very real role that the Batasang Pambansa will now have to play in the scheme of things. President Marcos himself indicated uh, in his address that a great deal of responsibility will rest with the Batasang Pambansa, the Legislative Assembly, uh, that has now taken upon itself the, the burden of all legislation. Prior to the lifting of martial law, the President was empowered to, to legislate uh, on his own uh, through, uh, through presidential decrees, letters of instructions and so on. Now his, uh, that, that burden, that heavy task has been transferred to the, to the Batasang Pambansa and we'll see how, how gentlemen like uh, Emmanuel Pelaez will respond to this challenge, sir. The vision <laughs> interrogator. <laughs> uh, sir, thank you. The uh, question is now, the President has given the Batasan Pambansa a challenge and a great responsibility. How must and how will this Assembly respond to that challenge and this responsibility? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, we have talked this over and uh, just a few minutes ago, a, a group of uh, Batasan members have agreed to file a resolution Firstly, to congratulate the President for his successful stewardship of the country under martial law, especially in uh, defending the security of the country. And secondly, to express the sense of the Batasan and of every member to renew its uh, determination to carry on with the gains of martial law until we shall have reached that point where we can shift to the elections of 19... Uh, 84 and elect a regular assembly. I, I, can, I could sense among my colleagues in the Batasan as we were listening to the president that uh, while the feeling was one of elation, at the same time there was a uh, sober realization of the fact that the ball is now with the people and primarily the Batasan Pambansa. It was also uh, quite an emotional moment. Uh. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, when, whenever you, you make a change, you, you already know what, what is there. And then you plunge into something unknown. 
for for eight years, as the president said, uh, we we have been under martial law discipline, and as he said, there are those who still doubt. Uh, we we are like a uh, patient who who has been sick, and uh, having been cured, the doctor tells him to go take the first steps and 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 go and fend for himself, and there is some doubt, but I I do believe that uh, with all the groundwork laid under martial law, we will be able to come out with a newly invigorated uh, democratic society. Sir, a newly invigorated democratic society will also mean a level of responsibility on the members of the opposition. What do you look for in, the, in, in this opposition as it looks today? Well, I think they are beginning in the first place to, to collect uh, their wits. I mean, I have been reading their platform, and and frankly, I, I don't think uh, it is a platform that uh, has much uh, substance. Uh, they they are uh, they are taking the first faltering steps. If if you will permit me, for instance, on the matter of American military bases, several months ago the opposition said we are for the dismantling of these bases. Now, several two or three days ago, when the UNIDO came out with its platform, it said, the people must decide whether this basis should be there or not. Now, where do they stand? But I, I do hope that they'll be able to come together and with the uh, fears that they had of martial law, now a thing of the past, I do hope that they can come together with a responsible platform and, and challenge the premises of the policies of the administration. I also hope that uh, we will avoid the uh, recrimination, the bitterness, the backbiting, and the what the president said, the scandalous uh, debate in the past, because all of us will be losers. So I am very much uh, encouraged by what happened today, and I have every faith that the Filipino people will take hold of themselves and take the reins of government, which is the essence of democracy. Thank you very much, uh, Assemblyman Emmanuel Pelais. Thank you very much, sir. Rita? We have had a series of uh, brief interviews here with several officials and uh, civilians who have given us their reactions and observations on the lifting of the proclamation of martial law.